Hi, guys. My name is Stephanie Lemus, and I work as part of the America's Global Black Belt team specializing in cloud native technologies. Um, a quick way of introduction, I've been with Microsoft 19 years. I joined the Azure team back in 2010. I'm hired as one of the original five Azure resources asked to go out and work with customers to help Microsoft figure out whether this public cloud thing had legs or not. Um, over my time with the team, I've worked with um, a number of different Azure businesses, both on the apps as well as the data side. Um, but to be honest, it inevitably I always seem to come back to teams that have a developer-centric story. And now that I'm back in the application business, one of the things that I've been trying to do is take some of what I've learned in these other businesses and figure out if there's a way that we can help developers with those technologies. You know, these are solutions that maybe Microsoft is talking to um, folks in your organization about that aren't developer-centric, but they could actually help your life as a developer make it easier. So this session is really all about talking about how Confluent and Kafka can help you pass data through your application more efficiently. Um, to do that work with less code, it's really, you know, that canonical holy grail that all modern developers are chasing. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with Kafka, don't feel bad. You know, there's a good reason why you maybe have never used it, never heard of it, never worked with it. And it's because it's traditionally been a big data play. It's been behind the data curtain. Um, I saw a lot of it when I was in the HPC business as a side, kind of a peanut butter and jelly to uh, HPC. Um, what we're seeing now in the cloud native front is we're seeing more and more modern cloud native architectures start to incorporate Kafka. Um, I would go so far as to say that for, their, for some use cases, Kafka is going to become um, a fundamental piece. It'll be as fundamental and as common as compute, networking, and storage on the architecture diagram. Um, Confluent are one of Microsoft's most strategic Azure partners, both on the data as well as the app side, for this very reason. Um, they have executive sponsorship um, in our highest um, ranks of the leadership team, as well as my team, the Global Black Belt team. Uh, what I want to do right now is pass it over to Dan Rosanova to show you why I'm so excited and so bullish on Confluent as our partner, specifically on the app side. He's going to show you how easy uh, Confluent Kafka is to use without the need to become a big data expert or learn a lot about Kafka. And what I'll do is I'll come back at the end to hope uh, to bring it all together for you. Thanks, Stephanie. I'm glad to be here today. Uh, I have a long history with Microsoft myself. I, I worked there in the past um, and have a lot of friends there. And I'm excited to talk today about how uh, Azure and Confluent uh, work so well together uh, for accelerating this whole this whole developer flow. Um, when we look at kind of what is Confluent all about, what are we here for, uh, we're really on a mission, and that mission is to set data in motion. And, uh, you know, how we kind of see that playing out is that uh, data today sits in a lot of places at rest, uh, mostly databases, sometimes structured data stores or unstructured, uh, and increasingly in the cloud. Um, and there are some foundational assumptions uh, of databases that the data is stable and it is at rest. Um, and this means that you're doing you know, kind of static queries, you're doing uh, real-time queries on static, stateful data, you're doing slow daily batch processing. Um, and increasingly, the world is moving away from that and moving towards real-time. Um, and real-time for applications, not just for data. Uh, so, you know, you look at how this kind of data at rest plays out, and what you end up with is enterprises end up with data kind of all over the place. Uh, different applications have different stores of data, often multiple databases and multiple applications, and increasingly things in the public cloud. So you have a mix of kind of cloud, public cloud, uh, on-prem or even private cloud, lots of databases, lots of services, and this is kind of the, the, the thing you end up with in all this uh, spaghetti is really kind of point-to-point -point integrations that really take up a lot of time. So even if you're trying to build a pretty simple integration or a pretty simple uh, capability into an application, this plumbing actually eats up a lot of your time. And it really requires a new paradigm uh, to think about data in motion. So uh, continuously uh, processing evolving streams of data in real time. Uh, and that's really what Confluence focused on. So thinking about data in terms of, instead of things at rest in a stable place, uh, things that happen, events, so a sale, a trade, a customer experience, a shipment, and what do those mean? So how do they show up to your backend operations? How do they show up to your uh, customer experiences and user interfaces uh, on, on the front end of what customers see and, and, and users see? So how do we stitch these things together? Um, and a way we see people doing that is using Confluent as a central nervous system for the modern enterprise and really more for information than for data. 
So organizing that data into something more useful uh, as actual information. And at Confluent, streaming is in our DNA. Uh, this is a company that was started by the people who, who founded uh, Apache Kafka uh, back at LinkedIn. Um, and we help the world's largest organizations uh, make streaming a part of their DNA as well. Uh, companies on this list uh, who we work very closely with are names that almost everyone will know um, and who are doing streaming sometimes in the cloud, sometimes not in the cloud. Some of them have been doing it before. Uh, public cloud was really widely popular. And when we say why Confluent, you know, there, there are lots of ways to move data around. Uh, when we think about Kafka, which is our heritage, uh, we think about the things we've done to make it really be uh, cloud native, uh, complete and everywhere. These are the kind of the three themes that support everything we do uh, in Confluent. The first is that if you're not too familiar with Kafka, uh, it's it's kind of the next generation of what what comes after uh, messaging systems. If you if you're familiar with messaging like um, IBM MQ or things like that, Tibco, uh, Kafka is a new paradigm for that of looking at streams rather than messages. And Kafka was originally designed to run in a data center and uh, be very close to the hardware. And so Kafka has required a lot of changes to be cloud native. And I'll talk in a second about what those are. But we've reimagined Kafka uh, to be truly cloud native, uh, to be complete. That's, that's an important piece for us. If we want to give you this central nervous system for information, uh, this, this ability to put all your data in motion and, and organize it, uh, we need to be more than just Kafka. So we need to really give you the tools uh, to, to build things faster, to think about the data flowing itself rather than the infrastructure that's supporting it. Um, and then to be everywhere, uh, which we need to be everywhere our customers want to be. And as I'm, I am as cloud native as it gets, I love the cloud, uh, which is what brought me to Microsoft in the first place. Uh, but there is still people running lots of workloads not in the cloud uh, or in uh, private clouds or in uh, uh, national clouds in other countries. And so going back to cloud native, uh, Confluent is really the only cloud-native Kafka solution. And when I say cloud-native, I really do mean something that's fully managed. Uh, it's, it's a serverless, infinitely scalable, elastic, and secure uh, experience. Uh, it's usage-based cost, uh, that whole idea of being able to not think about the infrastructure. That's what really makes it serverless. Uh, that ability to have infinite scale, whether that's through things we do like decoupling, compute, and storage, so that you can scale the two separately, uh, or even just scaling out across uh, regions. Uh, all these things we enable to give you this cloud native experience. That's of course, you know, what you expect, uh, uh, secure, reliable, global, uh, API driven, uh, and, and easy to plug into your existing CI CD pipelines. For complete, uh, Confluent both in our cloud and in our server uh, form, uh, really completes Apache Kafka. When you think about this stream of data, this, this set of streams of data you have flowing around, you want to make sure you have security of it, that you have man management and monitoring that's consistent, that's easy to reason about, uh, that you have on-ramps and off-ramps to that data, which we would call connectors, uh, and that you have data compatibility uh, capabilities. So you can transition between formats, that you can have governance over who's controlling what in that data, and also even do stream processing so you can start to see what's actually going on in this stream of continuous data that's flowing by uh, through your organization. And finally, uh, uh, everywhere. Everywhere is a really important piece to us because uh, we do have to meet customers where they are. Uh, this is uh, probably a big lesson that I took away myself uh, from my time working at Microsoft is it doesn't really matter what, what, what you think as a service provider or as a software vendor, it matters which customers think and where they are. And the reality is we have customers who are multi-cloud or public cloud or private cloud or still on-prem and sometimes even hybrid where they have a mix of all these things together. And this is one of the things that we're bringing with Confluent uh, to enable this, uh, including features like uh, cluster linking, the ability to, to link different Kafka clusters together in a uh, secure, reliable, uh, kind of natural uh, way that, that is easy to reason about, easy to work with, that preserves offsets and things like that, which are kind of advanced uh, Kafka topics, but uh, which I won't get into today, but uh, they are important. And this is great because this is the next step of how do you get from kind of seeing pub sub as the traditional kind of messages come here, they go there, uh, try and naively make it the center of the world like a hub and spoke. The world isn't very hub and spoke. In fact, when you look at the 
the model that was created when we say hub and spoke, we really mean kind of what FedEx did for shipping. And that model has lots of hubs that are connected by different spokes. Um, and uh, that's what we see happening with, with data streams as well. You will have uh, streams in some places for geographic reasons, maybe lower latency, maybe regulatory reasons, and some of the information you'll want to synchronize across regions uh, and do federation and kind of have like a mesh of, of data. And others you might just want to have DR uh, capabilities for in case there's a, a disaster and you need to do a failover. Um, and we can do all of those things cross-cloud, in-cloud, hybrid, and on-prem. So let's take a quick tour of, uh, of some of our stuff inside of Confluent Cloud. Um, I'm going to walk us through here the Azure portal. You can see I have a resource group here with some, some things inside of it. Um, and if I uh, take a look at this real quick, I can see that uh, I have uh, a resource in here called Confluent Organization. I'm going to click into real quick. Uh, I can see where it is. It's in East US 2. I can see some information about it. I can put on tags. And really importantly, I can actually click right into here to manage my Confluent Cloud. And uh, we've set up uh, AAD integration, so you don't have to sign up for another account or anything. We're flowing the credentials over through AAD. So you sign up through Azure, you get a Confluent environment to the organization. And here I have a cluster that's already made, but I'll walk you through real quick uh, what it looks like to create a cluster. It's very simple. Just pick kind of one, two, three, uh, what you want on a dedicated cluster. You want 10 megabytes, 100 megabytes a second, a gigabyte per second. You just pick that and then basic and standard are really serverless experiences. Here you can see all of the regions I'm available in uh, to, for that particular cluster uh, configuration uh, and uh, zone uh, capabilities for it, whether it's single or multi-zone. Like I said, I already have a cluster here, so we're just gonna go back and look at it. Um, and the center of Kafka is really topics. Topics are kind of the, the streams of data themselves. And I can see here, I have a couple topics and I'll click into one. This one's running some data through it right now through a job application and a function and some other stuff I'll talk about. But just within our portal, you can do things like produce uh, sample messages. You might want to see, hey, does this thing actually go through and test? Does my, does my receiving application actually get the data? But going back into Azure and showing a little bit more of this, I, I also have a, an Azure function here, um, which is uh, reading from the Kafka topic users that I just looked at. Uh, if I go look at this app, you can see it's a normal Azure function. Uh, it's this is actually a sample that's from the functions team. Uh, I have a link to it at the end of this talk. And if I go to the monitor tab and the logs, what I'll see here is this this application just writes out the messages it's reading to the log. So it's not a very useful application, but it's a good example of just how easy this is. And you see a bunch of data streaming by in real time there, uh, ticker prices in this example. And then I can go uh, browse over to the sample itself that I mentioned. This is from the, the Azure uh, Functions docs. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a very simple application. Uh, the Functions tools uh, work really well for this. You can run it locally, which I actually did first and then deployed. The tools works great on my Mac. Uh, here you can actually see the code. I have changed that password since then, so don't worry about that. Um, and then I can actually still use the kind of Functions development tools that I would have used uh, elsewhere or with other services. Um, and I can start up this same function right here um, and run it locally uh, in the uh, bash on my on my uh, local Mac. And uh, now that it's uh, up and running, it'll just uh, write out the same console window stuff. Like I said, this one's not a particularly fancy application, but we'll go into something more uh, useful than that right now, which is uh, actually if I leave uh, my bash window and go back into the browser, then I can actually go look in Confluent Cloud, it's something I, I mentioned connectors before about being the on and off ramp to our cloud. And here, if I look at this, I can see we have a, a big list of connectors that are available. Uh, there are over 100 right now, and I'm going to filter it down to just ones that are part of our, our, our managed service. You can see a lot of things like event hubs, like functions, uh, sources and syncs are kind of the sources and destinations, uh, SQL Server, Salesforce, uh, stuff like that. And so I can take all this data and uh, stream it to wherever I want. In this case, I'm going to pick an Azure Blob Sync. I'm going to choose a topic name. Uh, I could set some other data, like how often I want it to write uh, and things like that. And instead of setting it up in front of you, I'm just going to go to one I have set up already. That was the full setup screen, so there's not like other hidden stuff. Um, and you can see this one is running. I'll scroll down, and you can see the throughput. It's going through it right now. 
how many tasks, things like that. You can see it's had 4.2 million messages processed and it's up to date, meaning there's no messages behind. And this one's reading from the user's topic. We can see all those things I mentioned, like flush intervals, things like that. And so this is just taking the same thing that was being read by the Functions app and writing into a blob storage account. And here, if I open that blob storage account, go into containers, I can see the container that I uh, chose to drop this in. Um, and if I open it up, I'll see uh, files in here. Uh, and that's the topic name was users. Uh, the default is to use year, month, day is the naming mechanism. And I'll just click through these until I get to today and uh, show you uh, some uh, files in here is just the JSON that's being written. Um, you can choose to format these differently. I can get JSON and write Avro or other things like that. Um, so this is an easy way of how there's really no code to do that. I mean, the function piece is code, but this isn't. And what's also, also kind of cool is if I come in here and click on this data lineage thing, uh, this is something we have in, in a preview right now, uh, I can actually look at a, at a broader application of what I have lined up. Um, here, you can actually see I have a couple producers, I have a topic. On the right side, you can actually see that connector that I had uh, walked us through, and below it, you can even see the function. Um, and if I click on any of these things, like this connector, I can see details about it. I can see how many consumers there are in this segment of this application, how many tasks, uh, any problems it's having. Um, and if I go uh, click on other pieces, I can see details like uh, in the topic itself. What's the distribution of data across the partitions? Uh, how many megabytes in and out? I can examine the data itself with its schema. I can see here uh, bytes per app, bytes per partition, uh, kind of all the, the metrics and stuff you would expect. And this is an experience that's really made around streaming rather than just around kind of uh, IaaS or, or infrastructure itself. So this is all real-time data in motion type stuff. Um, and what's interesting is uh, I'll now switch to like the next thing I want to show is what does this application look like? Well, we usually draw diagrams that look kind of like uh, kind of like this, right? And that's kind of what you saw there was uh, there was a Java app on the left. I didn't show you the Java app. It's a real simple one. Um, and then a connector and a function on the right. Uh, nothing stops me from adding another connector, say pulling CDC off of SQL Server instance and flowing it to the same place to whether that's to a function or to a storage account, or to uh, Synapse, or something else. Um, and I can add these without disrupting the current flow that's going through there. So I can choose not just uh, publishers and subscribers for this data. I can actually do linking to other clusters and forwarding to other regions, and turn this into a graph that's more than just kind of a left side, right side, and that is really kind of a, a mesh. And we have all these capabilities built into the platform. Uh, it's available uh, in Azure now. but I do want to take a second and talk a little bit more about just Apache Kafka in Azure. Uh, and that's that Azure, Azure is a very rich platform. Uh, people, lots of people use it and lots of people do different things with it. And for running Kafka, there are really kind of four uh, common or popular ways. One is uh, infrastructure as a service. So when you think about uh, what does it mean to run Kafka on IaaS, it means that these, uh, these dark colored things are things that are taken care of for you by your provider. Uh, in Azure's case, things like physical security, net, physical network, physical storage, uh, servers, those are all done for you. Uh, those are things you don't have to worry about. But if you're running your own version of Kafka or, or Confluent platform, you do still have to do things like manage uh, the OS, uh, VMs, Zookeeper, brokers, uh, local storage, partition placement, load balancing. And as you move up the stack into other pieces, some of those get managed again by the provider for you. So if you think about like HD inside Kafka, some of these things get simplified for you because you no longer have to be responsible for running them. And then into somewhere like Event Hubs, which is a PaaS uh, service that I used to work with a lot. Um, and uh, more of these things get abstracted and you don't have to manage them. Like there's no such thing as Zookeeper in Event Hubs or it, 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 you know it's not something a user has to worry about. And then you get to Confluent Cloud, which is we're really trying to be a SaaS offering here. Um, and people say SaaS, and I say SaaS, and people get a little confused sometimes and think I'm talking about like a, like a Dynamics or CRM or something, but it, it's not. It's it's really uh, almost infrastructure SaaS, uh, so streaming SaaS. Um, and it's just about which level of abstraction is best for your scenario. You know, it's not common that any one of these is going to be the best for anyone or going to be the only one. 
Uh, you'll see lots of places that do a mix of IAs and a mix of PAS or a mix of SAS. So which of these you're going to pick is really dependent on kind of what other tools you have and what pieces are there. Um, but we are trying very hard to focus on being the best SaaS uh, in the, in the uh, data in motion space. Um, and with that, uh, I do want to uh, transition a little bit um, and then go back to Stephanie and, and show you what it's like to uh, actually sign up for Confluent Cloud um, in Azure and uh, talk a little bit about our deeper integration with Microsoft. So thanks, Dan. That was an awesome whirlwind tour of the platform. And we're going to just take you through the experience. What's it like to provision Confluent? Um, you know, as we said, Confluent are um, a good partner. They have deep relationships with us. It's really stupid simple to get started here. You're going to go to the portal. Um, you're going to create a resource group, or you're going to use a resource group that you already have resources in. You're going to give it a name. And then what you're going to do is you're going to enter your organization name. This can be something that makes sense to you or using a common naming standard in your organization. You're obviously going to select your region um, depending on where you're going to deploy your application. You're going to create it. Optionally, you can add some tags. You're going to be off, you're going to be running, and the deployment's going to start. And it's a really fast deployment. You should see that you have um, success in just a few minutes here. And once you've got your deployment up and running, that's when you can start doing things with it. Um, what we want to do is flip over and just really sort of close things off here. You know, Confluent are a really, really unique partner here. You know, the ease with which you saw provisioning that solution kind of speaks volumes around how deep this partnership is. As Dan mentioned, he was formerly with Microsoft. And I'll be honest, in my 19 years here, um, I've not seen a partner that's as unique as Confluent in so many different ways. Um, the first way that they're unique is that I've never seen a partner that has so many ex-Microsoft employees, in addition to former Azure team members on board. Um, you know, this is pretty special. It makes me smile. A lot of people that I know and I work with here, I still get to work with as a partner in Confluent. Um, and my experience isn't unique. You know, there's a lot of folks at uh, Confluent, like Dan, continue to maintain their relationships with the engineering teams that they came from. These are engineering teams across the Azure platform from Storage and Cosmos and SQL and Event Hubs. And, and in my opinion, this is their secret sauce. Um, this is how they're able to create this great low-friction experience that's easy for you to use that just works with the platform. This is really unique. Um, I think the other differentiator for Confluent is the fact that as former Blue Badges, they bring this natural understanding, this really deep understanding of what you, our Microsoft customers, are looking for uh, with regards to identity and security and support, a lot of the things that you see here on this slide. Um, if we go to the last slide, please. Um, really, you know, what we want you to do is, is give it a try. We've tried to make it as easy as possible. We've even given you an AKMS where you can go out and get a free trial with a really generous set of resources to start with. Dan, you know, how, how much do they get as part of the free, tr free trial? Yeah, so uh, if you sign up uh, for Confluent Cloud, you get $200 of free usage uh, per month for three months. Um, and if you go to developer.confluent.io, there's usually uh, uh, programs on there with uh, additional codes to get uh, money topped off on top of that. So we really want you to put your hands on the keyboards. And there's a lot of documentation. Um, I know, Dan, that you know I've been out to developer.confluent.io. There's a lot of resources out there. Do you have any tips or tricks as to what would be maybe the best tutorial to get started um, for someone who's never touched Kafka, never touched Confluent, and doesn't know where to start? Yeah. Uh, if you're a developer, I definitely think developer.confluent.io is a great place to start. Um, if you're more of a cloud native, uh, just do that free trial. Try out the product itself. It, if you don't like it, just stop using it. Um, and uh, the, the product itself actually has some quick starts and tutorials built into it uh, that should look and feel pretty familiar to people uh, in the Azure ecosystem. It's uh, a, a lot of the kind of focus we've taken is how do we, uh, as, as a very famous executive at Microsoft likes to say, bring you from zero to wow in five minutes. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I think that's it. You know, get out, give it a try, spin up a free trial. Um, we're here to help. So, again, reach out to your Microsoft account team or to your Confluent team if there's anything we can do to accelerate your testing. Um, we'd like to thank you. Make sure you fill out your evals and um, enjoy the rest of the conference.